step two, optical media. So in the previous step, we mentioned that we are interested in how light interacts with optical media. Now we will spend a few slides actually discussing what do we mean by optical media. So, first thing we need to consider is how do we need to change our description of electromagnetic radiation in a medium. We know how to describe it in free space, even in the presence of charges, but uh, things change a little bit when we are considering real physical media, such as air, water, glass, or metals. So, what are the two different categories of optical media that we're going to consider? On one hand, we've got the dielectrics. We already mentioned this. And the main uh, the property of dielectrics is that there are no free charges. We will actually see that this simplifies the Maxwell's equations considerably and makes our calculations a little bit easier. Also, an interesting property that we'll see of the dielectrics is that we can use them to polarize light. This will be a direct consequence of Fresnel equations. Examples of dielectrics are air, glass, water. We have seen this in the previous module as well. The other uh, category of optical media that we are going to talk about are conductors. And here, the biggest difference between dielectrics and conductors is that in conductors, we do have free charges. That's why they conduct electricity. And this will change the behavior of uh, electromagnetic waves in contact with uh, metals and conductors dr drastically. And examples are metals. In this lesson and half of next lesson, we are going to uh, concentrate on dielectrics, while the latter part of next lesson will be about conductors. So, what's the difference in terms of our description, in terms of our um, way how we talk about light when it comes from free, when we go from free space into describing waves in uh, dielectric media? Luckily, it's very simple. All we have to do is we have to look at our permittivity in vacuum, epsilon naught, and replace it by the following expression. We multiply it by some constant Ke. Now this product is the permittivity in the dielectric medium. What is Ke? You can go to tables and look it up. Every dielectric material has a different Ke. We do the same thing for the permeability in vacuum. We take our mu naught and we multiply it by a different uh, coefficient, which we will refer to as k subscript m. And this is the, now the permeability in the dielectric. Actually, there's a nice simplification here, and that is the fact that virtually for all dielectric materials that we're going to consider, km is approximately 1. So the permeability, when we go from vacuum to dielectric, doesn't really change. On the other hand, this is not true for permittivity. So, how does the uh, speed of light change? We know that in vacuum, the speed of light, C, subscript vacuum, just to emphasize that we are talking about vacuum, is given by 1 over epsilon naught times mu naught, the whole thing, square root. Well, if we want to find out the speed in our dielectric, all we have to do is substitute our new expressions for the permittivity and permeability in a dielectric. So we have Ke times epsilon naught and Km times mu naught. But we just said that Km is pretty much 1, so let's get rid of it. So the speed of light in the dielectric is given by this following expression. But we recognize that over here we've got our speed of light in vacuum. So what we can do is we can uh, write our speed of light in the dielectric as C vacuum divided by square root of Ke. In other words, the fraction of C vacuum divided by C in the dielectric is given by square root of Ke. And we know we, uh, what this fraction is. We have seen it in our previous module on overview of quantum uh, communication. It's nothing else but n in the dielectric, the refractive index of the dielectric. So, now let's consider about polarization of light. Before we have seen uh, linear polarization, and in particular we were always considering when the electric field is oscillating in the x-direction, which made the magnetic field oscillate in the y-direction, while the whole electromagnetic wave was propagating in the z-direction. But, 
here is the description of a plane harmonic wave. But this is not, uh, um, not always the case. This is a very particular choice. Other plural polarizations are also valid. In particular, the polarization could be uh, in the x-y plane. It doesn't just need to be along the x-axis. So it could be given by any of these arrows here. So if you rotate the polarization of the electric field, the polarization of the magnetic field will have to rotate accordingly. So in this case, this vector E0 telling us about the magnitude and polarization of our electromagnetic wave is then expressed as a sum uh, of this uh, form. We will denote the component along the x, x direction as E naught x and the component along the y direction as E naught y. Remember, there is no component along the z direction because z direction is the direction of propagation of the wave. And again, the magnetic field changes accordingly. That's the end of the, our step. Next, we will consider what happens at the boundary of two dielectrics.